Shall we pray? Father, as we open your holy book, we ask for an open mind and heart. We've spoken about some very solemn things. I trust, Lord, that you will impress hearts to study, to see if these things are so. I know I've studied them, and I'm firmly convinced that we are living in the last remnant of time. So remove any obstacles from human hearts that might keep people from hearing your voice. And we, we thank you for hearing our prayer, for we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. In this series, we have studied two abominations of desolation. The first was the destruction of Jerusalem by the Babylonians because of the abominations that were being committed by God's own professed people. The second was the destruction of Jerusalem by the Roman legions because they committed the greatest abomination, which was to reject Jesus Christ as the Messiah. But as we've seen, there will be a third abomination of desolation. When the United States imposes a national Sunday law that will eventually lead to national ruin. You see, what is going to happen is at the end of time, a law will be made that is contrary to divine legislation. You see, God legislated in His law that the seventh-day Sabbath is the day of rest. When man changes that commandment and says, no, it's not Sabbath, it's Sunday, human legislation is repa replacing divine legislation. There could be no greater apostasy and blasphemy than this. We notice that the sun and the eagle was involved in the first abomination of desolation in the Old Testament. We noticed that the second destruction of Jerusalem also involved the, the eagles of the Roman legions and the sun god Mithra, whom they worshipped. We've also noticed that in the end time, once again, the eagle of the United States and the imposition of the day of the sun will be involved. Now I want us to return to the Old Testament for the next several minutes to study about the sad apostasy of Israel before the first destruction of Jerusalem. God married Israel at Mount Sinai, but Israel was unfaithful to her wedding vows. Before the Babylonian captivity, God sent Jeremiah and Ezekiel to rebuke Israel. They were, to so to speak, God's divorce court lawyers. God was saying to Israel, I want a divorce because you folks have apostatized from me. Jeremiah 31 verse 32 tells us that God was going to make a new covenant, not according to the covenant that I made with their fathers in the day that I took them by the hand to lead them out of the land of Egypt. No, he says, my covenant which they broke, though I was a husband to them, says the Lord. In Ezekiel chapter 16, verse 32, the prophet said to Israel, You are an adulterous wife who takes strangers instead of her husband, because Israel intermingled with the apostate practices of the surrounding nations. Israel, God's unfaithful wife, was committing abominations. We find in Ezekiel chapter 1, in verses 1 and 2, a description of the abominations that were being committed. It says there, Again, the word of the Lord came to me, saying, Son of man, cause Jerusalem to know her abominations. These were being committed in those who professed to be God's true people. Ezekiel chapter 8 presents the abominations of Jerusalem in order of severity. And what is at the very, very top of the list of the worst abomination of all is the worship of the sun. Ezekiel 8, 15 and 16. Then he said to me, Have you seen this, O son of man? Turn again. You will see greater abominations than these. So he brought me into the inner court of the Lord's house. This is in, in the very temple. And there at the door of the temple of the Lord, between the porch and the altar, were about 25 men with their backs toward the temple of the Lord, and their faces toward the east, 
and they were worshiping the sun toward the east. So you have this unfaithful wife, God's professed people, that are committing abominations, the worst of which is the worship of the sun. And so God refers to his apostate bride as a harlot. Ezekiel 16 and verse 15 reads, God speaking to Israel, But you trusted in your own beauty, played the harlot because of your fame, and poured out your harlotry, the King James says, fornications on everyone passing by who would have it. We find in Ezekiel 16 verses 28 to 30, that Israel behaved as a harlot with the nations. Instead of having God and her husband as her husband, she mingled with the practices of the nations. It says there, You also played the harlot with the Assyrians, because you were insatiable. Indeed, you played the harlot with them, and still were not satisfied. Moreover, you multiplied your acts of harlotry as far as the land of the traitor, Chaldea, and even then you were not satisfied. How degenerate is, your, degenerate is your heart, says the Lord God, seeing you do all these things, the deeds of a brazen harlot. So you have this unfaithful wife practicing the abominations of the nations, especially the worship of the sun. God refers to, refers to her as an apostate harlot. And we're told that Israel decked herself, this is symbolic of course, decked herself with all sorts of jewels to impress her lovers. In Ezekiel chapter 16 and verse 17, God rebukes Israel and he says, You have also taken your beautiful jewelry from my gold and my silver, which I had given you, and made for yourselves male images and played the harlot with them. In Ezekiel 23 and verse 40, once again we find Israel symbolically painting her eyes and putting on ornaments to impress her lovers rather than to have a strong relationship with her Lord. It says there in Ezekiel 23 verse 40, Furthermore, you sent for men to come from afar, to whom a messenger was sent, and there they came, and you washed yourself for them painted your eyes, and adorned yourself with ornaments. So Israel is covering herself with jewelry to impress her lovers. She's being unfaithful to her husband. What were the abominations that she was committing? Yes, she was trampling on the Sabbath. She was also trampling on the sanctuary and shedding innocent blood. We're told in Ezekiel 23 and verse 28, Moreover, they have done this to me. They have defiled my sanctuary on the same day, and profaned my Sabbaths. In Ezekiel 16 verse 38, this is from the New International Version, we find that Jerusalem was shedding the blood of innocent people. It says, I will sentence you to the punishment of women who commit adultery, God says, and who shed blood. I will bring upon you the blood vengeance of my wrath and jealous anger. So they were persecuting and killing the innocent, the faithful in Jerusalem. And the sad thing is that the religious leaders were leading them down the wrong road, but the people were happy with it. Jeremiah chapter 5 and verse 31 says, The prophets prophesy falsely, and the priests rule by their own power. And my people love to have it so. For this reason, God decided that he would pour out the cup of his wrath upon the city of Jerusalem. We find in Ezekiel 23 and verse 32, God speaking to his apostate people, You have walked in the way of your sister. Therefore, I will put her cup in your hand. Thus says the Lord God, You shall drink of your sister's cup the deep and wide one, you shall be laughed to scorn and be held in derision. It contains much. So Judah, Israel, was going to drink the cup of God's wrath because of her apostasy, apostasies. God prophesied that destruction would come from the four corners of the earth. 
We find in Ezekiel chapter 7 and verses 1 through 8 a vivid description of the destruction that would come from the four corners of the earth. It says there in Ezekiel 7 verse 1, Moreover the word of the Lord came to me, saying, And you, son of man, thus says the Lord God to the land of Israel, An end! The end has come upon the four corners of the land. Now the end has come upon you, and I will send my anger against you. I will judge you according to your ways, and will repay you for all your abominations. My eye will not spare you, nor will I have pity, but I will repay your ways, and your abominations in, will be in your midst. Then you shall know that I am the Lord. Thus says the Lord God, a disaster, a singular disaster, behold, it has come. An end has come, the end has come, it is dawn for you, behold, it has come. Doom has come to you, you who dwell in the land, the time has come, a day of trouble is near, and not of rejoicing in the mountains. Now upon you I will soon pour out my fury and spend my anger upon you. I will judge you according to your ways. I will repay you for all your abominations. Notice the number of times that the word abominations is used here. And God is going to pour out His wrath upon Jerusalem because of their abominations. An end will come upon the four corners of the earth. But before the destruction, there was a ceiling. You see, there was a group in the city that was faithful to the Lord. They were not worshiping the Son. They were not practicing the abominations. Let's read Ezekiel chapter 9, verses 1 to 6. Then he called out in my hearing with a loud voice, saying, Let those who have charge over the city draw near, each with a deadly weapon in his hand. And suddenly six men came from the direction of the upper gate, which faces north, each with his battle axe in his hand. One man among them was clothed with linen, and had a writer's inkhorn at his side. They went in and stood beside the bronze altar. Now the glory of the Lord of Israel had gone up from the cherub where it had been, to the threshold of the temple. And he called to the man clothed with linen, who had the writer's inkhorn at his side. And the Lord said to him, Go through the midst of the city. This is Jerusalem, folks. Go through the midst of the city, through the midst of Jerusalem, and put a mark on the foreheads of the men who sigh and cry over all the abominations that are done it, in it, so that you have those who were practicing the abominations most, and you have those who were actually sighing and crying because of the abominations. Verse 5, To the others he said in my hearing, Go after him through the city and kill. Do not let your eyes spare, nor have any pity. Utterly slay old and young, young men, maidens and little children and women, but do not come near anyone on whom is the mark, and begin at my sanctuary. So they began with the elders who were before the temple, that is with the religious leaders. So notice that there is a sealing of the faithful before the destruction of the city, and the seal is placed on the foreheads of those who are in the city. Now before the destruction, the people were trampling on God's holy Sabbath. Notice Ezekiel 20, verse 12, and then we will read verses 19 to 21. Ezekiel 20, 12, and then 19 through 21. God said, Moreover, I also gave them my Sabbaths to be a sign between them and me, that they might know that I am the Lord who sanctifies them. So the Sabbath was God's sign. Verses 19 to 21 read, I am the Lord your God. Walk in my statutes, keep my judgments and do them. Hallow my Sabbaths, and they will be a sign between me and you, that you may know that I am the Lord your God. Notwithstanding, the children rebelled against me. They did not walk in my statutes, and were not careful to observe my judgments, which if a man does, he shall live by them. But they profaned my Sabbaths. Then I said, I would pour out my fury on them and fulfill my anger against them in the wilderness. So they were trampling on the Sabbath. In fact, the great sin that led to the destruction of Jerusalem was not only that they were worshiping the sun, but also that they were trampling on the Sabbath. Notice Jeremiah 17, verse 27. God warned them, But if you will not heed me, 
to hallow the Sabbath day, such as not carrying a burden when entering the gates of Jerusalem on the Sabbath day, I will kindle a fire in its gates, and it shall devour the palaces of Jerusalem, and it shall not be quenched. God says, if you don't hallow my Sabbaths, if you don't keep the Sabbath holy, I will destroy Jerusalem. And then God predicted that the lovers that Israel had a relationship with would turn against her. Notice Ezekiel chapter 16 and verse 39. I will also give you into their hand, and they shall throw you down. They shall throw down your shrines and break down your high places. They shall also strip you, you of your clothes and take your beautiful jewelry and leave you naked and bare. So this is a story from the Old Testament. Now we need to take a look at the history of the New Testament church. You see, the New Testament tells us that Jesus is the husband and the church is his bride. Ephesians chapter 5 verse 25 reads, Husbands, love your wives just as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for her. So husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church. In Revelation chapter 12 and verse 1, we find the Old Testament church represented by a woman. It says there in Revelation 12 verse 1, Now a great sign appeared in heaven, a woman clothed with the sun, with the moon under her feet, and her, on her head a garland of twelve stars. And then it speaks about the birth of the man-child, which refers to the birth of Jesus Christ. So we find that the true church is represented by a pure woman. A counterfeit church or an apostate church is represented by a harlot woman. Now this woman that we find in Revelation chapter 12 and verse 1, at first this woman was pure. In other words, the church in the apostolic times kept the pure doctrines. It was a pure church. It did not mingle with the practices of the surrounding nations. It eventually came to the point where this woman had to flee because the harlot would persecute her. So I want you to notice that during the 1260 years, there were actually two churches. Ah, in Jerusalem there were those who were worshiping the sons and those who sighed and cried. You say, what do you mean? Well, let's notice that in Revelation chapter 12 and verse 6, we're told, Then the woman fled into the wilderness, this is the pure woman of verse 1, where she has a place prepared by God that they should feed her there 1,260 days. During this time, the harlot woman is persecuting the woman in, in Revelation chapter 12 and verse 1. So you have the faithful church that flees, represented by this pure woman, and you have the harlot woman who is persecuting God's people during that same period. But unfortunately, the apostolic church in the 4th century became a harlot by forsaking her legitimate husband, Jesus Christ, and falling in love with the civil power and the pagan customs of the surrounding nations. Revelation chapter 17 describes the characteristics of this unfaithful woman. Let's read the verses. Then one of the seven angels who had the seven bowls came and talked with me, saying to me, Come, I will show you the judgment of the great harlot who sits on many waters, with whom the kings of the earth committed fornication, and the inhabitants of the earth were made drunk with the wine of her fornication. The woman was arrayed in purple and scarlet, and adorned with gold and precious stones and pearls, having in her hand a golden cup full of abominations and the filthiness of her fornication. And on her forehead a name was written, Mystery, Babylon the Great, the mother of harlots and of the abominations of the earth. And then John says, I saw the woman drunk with the blood of the saints and with the blood of the martyrs of Jesus, and when I saw her, I marveled with great amazement. Now the entire chapter 17 revolves around this woman. She is the main actor of the story. Let's summarize what this passage says. A harlot woman 
represents a church that has apostatized from the truth. She sits on multitudes, nations, tongues, and peoples, which means that she rules over the earth. She carries on an adulterous affair with the kings of the world, with the political powers of the world, thus forsaking her wedding vows with Jesus Christ. She has a golden cup in her hand with fermented wine, and the fermented wine is her abominations. And she forces all nations to drink the wine of her fornication, and the nations become drunk with her wine. When the nations drink the wine, they become angry because it's called the wine of the wrath of her fornication. The harlot clothes herself in certain colors, purple and scarlet. She decks herself with gold, precious stones, and pearls to impress her lovers. The harlot has daughters that were born from her at some point because she is called the mother of harlots. The vile woman is drunk with the blood of the saints and the martyrs of Jesus. This, besides being a church, is also a political power. You say, how do we know this? Because Revelation chapter 17 and verse 18 tells us that she reigns over the kings of the earth. And we're told in Revelation 17 and verse 16 that the kings will hate this harlot and they will leave her naked, eat her flesh, and burn her with fire. That's a way of saying that they're going to be very angry at her in the end. Now let's unpack the details that we've noticed here regarding this harlot woman, the main protagonist of this passage. A woman in prophecy, as I've mentioned, represents a church, and a harlot woman represents a harlot or apostate church. Revelation 17 verse 1 is talking about that harlot church. Then one of the seven angels who had the seven bowls came and talked with me, saying to me, Come, I will show you the judgment of the great harlot who sits on many waters. What do the many waters represent? Well, let's read verse 15. Revelation chapter 17 verse 15. We already read verse 1. It says in verse 15, Then he said to me, the waters which you saw where the harlot sits are peoples, multitudes, nations, and tongues. And the active city means that she rules over them. So you have this apostate church represented by the harlot. She's sitting on many waters, which means that she rules over the political powers of the world. In fact, this brings us to our next characteristic. She actually has an illegitimate love affair, spiritually speaking, with the political powers of the world. You say, how do we know that? Because of 17, Revelation 17, verse 2. It says there, with whom the kings of the earth committed fornication, and the inhabitants of the earth were made drunk with the wine of her fornication. In other words, she entertains an illegitimate relationship with the kings of the earth instead of having a relationship with her only husband, Jesus Christ. She's also clothed in a special manner to attract the attention of the kings. We find in Revelation 17, verse 4, the woman was arrayed in purple and scarlet. Those are the colors of the Roman Catholic papacy, the main colors, by the way. And adorned with gold and precious stones and pearls, just like the Old Testament Israel, having in her hand a golden cup full of abominations and the filthiness of her fornication. So she's clothed in a certain way, and she's filled with gold and silver and precious jewels. She's also a mother, which means that at some point in her history, daughters must have been born from her. Protestantism, apostate Protestantism, as it exists today, was born from the mother, never forsook all of the teachings of the mother. You see, the mother teaches that the, the immortality of the soul. We're going to notice this. The mother teaches that Sunday is the day of rest. Protestants inherited these practices from the mother. It says in Revelation 17, verse 5, On her forehead was a name written, Mystery, Babylon the Great, the mother of harlots and of the abominations of the earth. She also has a golden cup in her hand with fermented wine. 
the fermented wine are her abominations. It says in Revelation chapter 17 and verse 2, with whom the kings of the earth committed fornication, and the inhabitants of the earth were made drunk with the wine of her fornication. And she is filled with abominations, just like Old Testament Israel. Revelation 17 verse 15 tell us, tells us, And on her head a name was written, Mystery, Babylon the Great, the mother of harlots, and of the abominations of the earth. Now do you know why this church, which is called Babylon by the way you notice, why this church fell and became Babylon? It's because she gave her wine to all of the nations. Let's read the second angel's message in Revelation chapter 14, Revelation chapter 14, and we will read verse 8. Revelation 14 verse 8, And another angel followed, saying, Babylon is fallen, is fallen. That great city, and now comes the reason, because she has made, this means forced, she has made all nations drink of the wine of the wrath of her fornication. So the wine in her cup are her abominations. And she gives it to the nations, and whoever doesn't want to drink, the wrath of the woman is against them. Now the question is, what are her abominations? Well, we need to go back to the Old Testament to see what the abominations were. The first abomination is making idols and bowing before them. Let's read several verses. Exodus chapter 20 and verses 4 through 6. Exodus 20, 4 through 6. You shall not make for yourself a carved image, any likeness of anything that is in heaven above or that is in the earth beneath or that is in the water under the earth. You shall not bow down to them nor serve them. Not only making images, but bowing down to them. For I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God, visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children to the third and fourth generations of those who hate me, but showing mercy to thousands to those who love me and keep my commandments. This is the second commandment of God's holy law. Who would dare make images and bow down before them like the papacy does in violation of this commandment? Deuteronomy chapter 7, verses 25 and 26. God told Israel as they entered the promised land, You shall burn the carved images of their gods with fire. You shall not covet the silver or gold that is on them, nor take it for yourselves, lest you be snared by it, for it is an abomination. So notice, bowing down before images is an abomination to the Lord your God. Nor shall you bring an abomination, that is an idol, into your house, lest you be doomed to destruction like it, you shall utterly detest it and utterly abhor it, for it is an accursed thing. Notice Deuteronomy chapter 27 and verses 14 and 15. And the Levites shall speak with a loud voice and say to all the men of Israel, Cursed is the one who makes a carved image or molded image, an abomination to the Lord, the work of the hands of the craftsmen, and sets it up in secret. And all the people shall answer and say, Amen. So, making images and bowing before them is an abomination. It's part of the wine that the harlot has in her cup. Delving into the occult and saying that you can communicate with the dead is an abomination. All occultic practices, by the way, all occultic practices are based on the false theology of the immortality of the soul. Notice Deuteronomy chapter 18 verses 9 through 12. God told Israel, when you come into the land which the Lord your God is giving you, you shall not learn to follow the abominations. There's the word abominations again. When we dealt with idolatry, it's abominations. Here it says, you shall not learn to follow the abominations of those nations. There shall not be found among you anyone who makes his son or his daughter pass through the fire, or one who practices witchcraft, that includes santeria, that includes all of these occultic practices, voodoo, etc. Or a soothsayer, or one who interprets omens, or a sorcerer, or one who conjures spells, or a medium, or a spiritist, or one who calls up the dead. For all who do these things are an abomination to the Lord. And because of these abominations, the Lord your God drives them out from before you. The Roman Catholic Church teaches that you can pray to the saints who passed away. 
Well, if you can pray to the saints, that must mean that their soul departed from the body and went to heaven, and you can pray to them. But here it says, you shall not call up the dead, which is based on a false theology of the immortality of the soul. Another abomination is the idea that um, you can be saved in your sins, that you don't need to turn away from your sins. Notice Proverbs chapter 28 and verse 9. One who turns his ear from hearing the law, even his prayer is an abomination. So in other words, turning away from the law and saying that sin is not consequential because we're weak human beings, that is an abomination in the sight of God. But the other extreme is also an abomination, the idea that you can be saved by your works. So one extreme is the idea that you can be saved in your sins, the other one is that you can be saved by your works. Notice Luke chapter 16 verse 15. Jesus is speaking and he said to them, You are those who justify yourselves before men, but God knows your hearts. For what is highly esteemed among men is an abomination in the sight of God. So whether you believe that you can be saved in your sins or you can be saved by your works, it's an abomination. The Roman Catholic papacy teaches, well, you know, uh, we're weak. If you commit a sin, just go and confess it to the priest, and the priest will absolve you. On the other hand, it says, you know, by pilgrimages and by penance and things like that, you can actually work your way to heaven. Ellen White wrote this very interesting statement in Great Controversy, page 572, about the papacy. This is speaking to Protestants. A prayerful study of the Bible would show Protestants the real character of the papacy. So what would they have to do to know the real character of the papacy? Study the Bible. She continues, A prayerful study of the Bible would show Protestants the real character of the papacy and would cause them to abhor and shun it. But many are so wise in their own conceit that they feel no need of humbly asking God that they may be led into the truth. Although priding themselves on their enlightenment, they are ignorant both of the scriptures and of the power of God. They must have some means of quieting their consciences, and they seek that which is least spiritual and humiliating. What they desire is a method of forgetting God that shall pass as a method of remembering Him. The papacy is well adapted to meet the wants of all these, not the, not the needs, but the wants of all these. It is prepared, the papacy is prepared for two classes of mankind embracing nearly the whole world, those who would be saved by their merits and those who would be saved in their sins. Here is the secret of its power. Another abomination is adultery, fornication, spiritual adultery in the case of the papacy because she fornicates with the kings of the earth. The church is to be allied only to Jesus. It should not get the state to do what the church wants. Jeremiah 13, 26 and 27. Therefore I will uncover your skirts, God says, over your face, that your shame may appear. I have seen your adulteries and your lustful nighings, the lewdness of your harlotry, your abominations on the hills and in the fields. Woe to you, O Jerusalem! Will you still not be made clean? Another abomination is shedding innocent blood, which the papacy did through the Inquisition, all throughout the 1260 years of her dominion. Notice Ezekiel chapter 22 and verse 2. Moreover, the word of the Lord came to me, saying, Now, son of man, will you judge? Will you judge the bloody city? Yes, show her all her abominations. Proverbs 17 and verse 15 tells us, He who justifies the wicked and he who condemns the just both of them alike are an abomination to the Lord. Proverbs chapter 6, verses 16 through 19. These six things the Lord hates. Yes, seven are an abomination to Him. A proud look, a lying tongue, hands that shed innocent blood, a heart that devised wicked plans, feet that are swift in running to evil, a false witness who speak lies, and one who sows discord among brethren. Another one of those elements of abominations or the wine of the apostate church's abomination is homosexuality. 
you know what has happened among the priesthood of the Roman Catholic Church. Leviticus 18 verse 2 says, You shall not lie with a male as with a woman. It is an abomination. But the greatest abomination of all, as we noticed in Ezekiel, was worshiping the sun. The Roman Catholic Church is obsessed with the sun. There are sunbursts everywhere if you look carefully. One of the reasons why the papacy adopted Sunday as the day of rest was to make it comfortable for the pagans to become Christians. As we noticed in Ezekiel chapter 8 verses 16 and 17, one of the great sins that was being committed in the Old Testament, in fact the greatest sin of all, it was at the top of the list of abominations, was that the religious leaders had their backs to the temple and they were worshiping the sun. We're not going to read that uh, passage again. It's long. It's Ezekiel chapter 8 and verses 16 and 17. And somebody might say, well, Pastor Bohr, but it's not the same to worship the sun as it is to worship on the day of the sun. I've covered this before, but I want to do it again because there might be people watching this presentation that did not see the previous ones. Is it the same to worship the sun as it is to worship on the day of the sun? I say in principle, yes. You say, why is that? Let me ask you, who created the sun? God did. Did He create the sun for worship, as an object of worship? No. It's a secular object to give us light. So what happens if you make the sun an object of worship? That's called idolatry. Now let me ask you, who created the first day of the week? God. Did He create the first of, uh, day of the work, week for worship? No. It's a work day. Six days you shall labor. So what happens if you make the first day of the week a day of worship? It's idolatry. It doesn't matter if you make an object an object of worship or a day a day of worship. Anything that man makes for worship is idolatry. Ellen White wrote in Great Controversy, page 389, When faithful teachers expound the Word of God, there arise men of learning, ministers, professing to understand the scriptures, who denounce sound doctrine as heresy, and thus turn away inquirers after truth. What a tremendous responsibility will fall upon ministers who lead people astray. She continues, Were it not that the world is hopelessly intoxicated with the wine of Babylon, multitudes would be convicted and converted by the plain cutting truths of the word of God. However, Religious faith appears so confused, which is the meaning of the word Babylon, and discordant that the people know not what to believe as truth. The sin of the world's impenitence lies at the door of the church. You see, the papacy supports and teaches a plethora of beliefs and practices that either are contrary to the Bible or they are absent from the Bible. Here are some of them. None of these are in the Bible, and many are contrary to the Bible. The sanctity of Sunday, the union of church and state, the sacrifice of the math, mass, infant baptism, Lent, canonizing the saints, praying to and for the saints, lighting candles, burning incense, sprinkling holy water, crafting idols and bowing before them, the use of holy vestments, the Easter cross on the forehead, auricular confession of sins to a mere man, praying the rosary, the sign of the cross, celibacy, purgatory, convents, monasteries. I could continue the list. It's endless. None of these things are condoned by the Bible, and many of them contradict the Bible. You see, the cup with the wine not only into intoxicates those who drink it, but it also calls, causes them to get angry at those who don't drink. Jeremiah 51 verse 7 speaks about ancient Babylon. And it says there, Babylon was a golden cup in the Lord's hand that made all the earth drunk. The nations drank her wine, that is, the nations drank the wine of Babylon, and what was the result? Therefore the nations are deranged. I want to read another statement that we find in the book Testimonies to Ministers, pages 61 and 62. This is a powerful statement. The fallen denominational churches are Babylon. Babylon has been fostering poisonous doctrines, the wine of error. 
So the wine of error is poisonous doctrines. This wine of error is composed of false doctrines, such as, and now she's going to give a sampling, such as the natural immortality of the soul, the eternal torment of the wicked, that is a false view of hell, the denial of the pre-existence of Christ prior to His birth in Bethlehem, and advocating and exalting the first day of the week above God's holy and sanctified day. These and kindred errors, see this is only a partial list, are presented to the world by the various churches, and thus the scriptures are fulfilled that say, For all nations have drunk of the wine of the wrath of her fornication. It is a wrath that is created by false doctrines. And when kings and presidents drink the wine of the wrath of her fornication, they are stirred with anger against those who will not come into harmony with the false and satanic heresies which exalt the false Sabbath and lead men to trample underfoot God's memorial. The harlot and her daughters have made the multitudes spiritual alcoholics, and they are so addicted and intoxicated that it is virtually impossible for people to think rationally and to grasp the truth. The harlot's spiritual alcohol controls them. It is impossible to reason with a drunkard. Drunkards are quite sure that they know everything and will argue with you until they are blue in the face. Ellen White wrote in the book Counsels to Writers and Editors, page 47, Error is never harmless. It never sanctifies but always brings confusion and dissension. Error is always dangerous. The enemy has great power over minds that are not thoroughly fortified by prayer and established in Bible truth. So spiritual wine does to people spiritually what literal wine does to people literally. The alcohol clouds the mind, makes it impossible to think straight, to make right decisions, to distinguish between right and wrong, the holy and the common. That's why God warned kings and rulers not to drink wine, because they wouldn't be able to grasp the truth. Proverbs 31 verses 4 and 5 says, It is not for kings, O Lemuel, it is not for kings to drink wine, nor for princes intoxicating drink, lest they drink, notice what, what the result is, lest they drink and forget the law, and pervert the justice of all the afflicted. Wow! Leviticus 10, 8-11 describes the story of Nadab and Abihu, who offered common fire as if it were holy. Let's read those verses. Then the Lord spoke to Aaron, saying, Do not drink wine or intoxicating drink, you nor your sons with you, when you go into the tabernacle of meeting, lest you die. This is after Nadab and Abihu were consumed by fire. God says, Don't drink wine or intoxicating drink. It shall be a statute forever throughout your generations. Why weren't the priests to drink wine? Because it says in verse 10, That you may distinguish between the holy and the unholy, and between the unclean and clean. And also, that you may teach the children of Israel all the statutes which the Lord has spoken to them by the hand of Moses. We have the story in Daniel chapter 5, of King Belshazzar, who knew the story of Nebuchadnezzar's insanity for seven years. He knew that Nebuchadnezzar had become boastful, and God humbled him, and then returned his reason to him. And yet, in spite of the fact that Belshazzar knew all of this, we are told in Daniel 5 that he brought the holy vessels from the temple to drink wine out of them. Let's read it in Daniel 5, verses 1 through 4. Belshazzar the king made a great feast for a thousand of his lords, and drank, drank wine in the presence of the thousand. And now notice the result. While he tasted the wine, Belshazzar gave the command to bring the gold and silver vessels that his father Nebuchadnezzar had taken from the temple that had been in Jerusalem, that the king and his lords, his wives, and his concubines might drink from them, taking holy vessels to drink wine from. Verse 3, then they brought the gold vessels that had been taken from the temple of the house of God, which uh, that had been in Jerusalem. And the king and his lords, his wives, and his concubines drank from them. They drank wine. And what is the result? Idolatry. They praised the gods of gold and silver, bronze, iron, wood, and stone. 
Ellen White wrote a very interesting statement about uh, the danger of replacing the Sabbath and putting Sunday in its place. She wrote this, But this day, that is Sunday, so universally exalted is a spurious Sabbath, a common working day. It is accepted in the place of the day that the Lord has blessed and sanctified. But the sure result of this course may be seen in the punishment that fell upon Nahab and Abihu, the sons of Aaron. As priests of God, these men had been commanded to offer always the fire of God's own kindling, which was kept burning before God day and night. This was ever to be strictly observed. But Nahab and Abihu drank wine too freely. And because of this, their minds were not keen, but confused, and they were unable to distinguish between the sacred and the common. Are you catching the picture? How do you suppose God feels when people say, well, I know that uh, the Bible says that the seventh day is holy, but I'm going to keep the first day instead. God is going to have to then apologize to Nahab and Abihu because they took something common and they made it holy. How do you suppose God feels about human beings changing His divine legislation? Puny, weak human beings. Very important. The harlot sheds the blood of God's faithful people. Revelation 17 verse 6 says, I saw the woman drunk with the blood of the saints and with the blood of the martyrs of Jesus. And when I saw her, I marveled with great amazement. Shedding of blood was an abomination as well. I hope you're understanding all of these abominations. Every single one of them is practiced by the Roman Catholic papacy. And Protestants practice many of these characteristics because they are the daughter of the harlot. What is going to come as a result of this apostasy? Destruction. Revelation chapter 6 verses 14 through 17 describe what is going to take place. The sky receded as a scroll when it is rolled up, and every mountain and island was moved out of its place. And the kings of the earth, the great men, the rich men, the commanders, the mighty men, every slave and every free man, hid themselves in the caves and in the rocks of the mountains, and said to the mountains and rocks, Fall on us and hide us from the face of him who sits on the throne and from the wrath of the land. For the great day of his wrath has come, and who is able to stand? However, just like in the Old Testament, before the destruction comes, there is going to be a sealing process. A seal is going to be placed on the foreheads of those who sigh and cry because of the abominations that are being committed in the religious world. Revelation chapter 7 verses 1 to 3 describes that sealing. It says, After these things I saw four angels standing at the four corners of the earth. Remember the four corners in the Old Testament? You know, when the angels released the, four, the, the winds from the four corners, the entire world, the four corners of the world, will have the worst tribulation in the history of of this planet. So it says, After these things I saw four angels standing at the four corners of the earth, holding the four winds of the earth, that the wind should not blow on the earth, on the sea, or on any tree. Then I saw another angel ascending from the east, having the seal of the living God. And he cried with a loud voice to the four angels to whom it was granted to harm the earth and the sea. Remember the man uh, clothed in linen in the Old Testament? Verse 3, saying, Do not harm the earth, the sea, or the trees, till we have sealed the servants of our God on their foreheads. But the opposite of the seal of God is the mark of the beast. Revelation chapter 13, verse 16, speaking about this beast that rises from the earth, apostate Protestantism, doing the biddings of the mother from which they were born. It says, He causes all, both small and great, rich and poor, free and slave, to receive a mark on their right hand or on their foreheads. So the wicked receive a mark on their foreheads, the righteous receive a mark on their foreheads before the destruction. Revelation 14 verse 1 describes the seal of God. Then I looked, and behold, a lamb standing on Mount Zion, and with him 144,000, having his father's name written on their foreheads. You see, the reason why God calls his people, his faithful people, to worship the Creator, and to keep His Holy Sabbath is because at the end, virtually the entire world is going to be observing the day of the sun. That's why Revelation 14, verse 7, the first angel's message says, 
uh, the following. Fear God and give glory to Him, for the hour of His judgment has come. And worship Him who made heaven and earth, the sea and springs of water. And of course, Genesis tells us the sign of the Creator is the Holy Sabbath. Those who have the mark of the beast will drink the wine of God's wrath, just like we saw with Old Testament Israel. We're told in the third angel's message, Revelation 14 and verse 9, Then a third angel followed them, saying with a loud voice, If anyone worships the beast and his image, and receives his mark on his forehead or on his hand, he himself shall also drink of the wine of the wrath of God, which is poured out full strength into the cup of his indignation. Incidentally, at the very end, the kings of the earth and even the multitudes are going to hate this harlot who deceived them. You find this in Revelation chapter 17 and verse 16. You see, it says there, And the ten horns which you saw on the beast, these will hate the harlot, make her desolate and naked, eat her flesh, and burn her with fire. But as with the destruction of Jerusalem the first time, there will be a faithful remnant who sighs and cries and do not practice these abominations. In the second destruction of Jerusalem, before that, you find God's people fleeing. The apostate people staying, and those who fled were spared because they sighed and cried because the Messiah had been rejected by God the people. So God gives a special call to His faithful people who are in Babylon, who have drunk this wine. He wants them to sober up. He wants them to be on the right side. He wants them to receive the seal of God, not the mark of the beast. So He's going to give one last warning to the world, making a call to them. Let's notice that in Revelation chapter 18 and verse 1. After these things, I saw another angel coming down from heaven, having great authority, and the earth was illuminated with his glory. In other words, there's a, this is not a literal angel. This is a message that is imparted to the world by a group of people on earth. It's just like the three angels' messages. You don't see an angel whiz through heaven preaching the everlasting gospel, another whizzing through heaven preaching about the fall of Babylon, the, another one whizzing across the sky uh, preaching against the mark of the beast and his image. No. This is referring to an angelic message that is imparted to the human race by human beings who sigh and cry because of the abominations that are taking place. That glory of this angel is going to fill the entire world. Now let me ask you, what will be the condition of the spiritual world at that time, Babylon? Babylon is composed of three parts, the dragon, the beast, and the false prophet. The dragon represents the civil powers of the world, of course, influenced by Satan. The beast represents the papacy, and the false prophet, or the beast that rises from the earth, represents apostate Protestantism, the daughters who were born from the mother. So what condition is Babylon going to be in? When this message is imparted, it says there in Revelation chapter 18 and verse 2, And he cried mightily with a loud voice, saying, Babylon the great is fallen, is fallen, and has become a dwelling place of demons, a prison for every foul spirit, and a cage for every unclean and hated bird. That's a terrible denunciation of what the condition of the religious world is going to be at the end of time. Notice verse 3. For all nations, why, why did Babylon fall? For all nations have drunk of the wine of the wrath of her fornication. The kings of the earth have committed fornication with her, and the merchants of the earth have become rich through the abundance of her luxury. It even speaks about the economies of the world. And then I want you to notice the last point that we find here in this passage in Revelation 18 and verse 4. You see, most of God's true people now are in Babylon. You say, now wait a minute. Are they Babylonian? No, they're not Babylonian. They're in Babylon. It's just like Lot was in Sodom 
but Lot was not of Sodom. On the other hand, Lot's wife was in Sodom, and she was of Sodom, and that's why she was destroyed. There will be a faithful group in all of the churches. Don't get me wrong, I'm not saying Seventh-day Adventists are the only, the, the only people in the world that are going to be saved. No, there are multitudes of people in all of the churches, Catholic, Protestant, you name it, who are sincere. They love Jesus. They serve Him to the best of their knowledge and ability. They don't know these things. And when they know these things, they are going to respond to a special call that we find in verse 4 of Revelation chapter 18. And I heard another voice from heaven saying, Come out of her. That is, come out of Babylon. My people. So God has a people in Babylon. Come out of her, my people. Why? Lest you share in her sins, and lest you receive her plagues. So you'll notice here that God gives a final call to come out of apostasy and embrace the fullness of truth as we find it in God's Word. So some people say, so you're saying that the final conflict is going to be whether we keep Sabbath or keep Sunday? Yes, absolutely. But I want you to understand that the final conflict is not primarily a conflict over days, but over the authority that stands behind the days. You see, if you keep Sunday, you are saying, I accept the authority of the power that claims to have established the Sunday as a day of worship. If you keep the Sabbath, you're saying, I'm accepting the authority of the divine lawgiver who said that you're supposed to keep the Sabbath. So behind the issue of the days is authority. God is testing whose authority we accept. Do we accept God's authority? who says that we're supposed to keep the Sabbath in honor of our wonderful Creator? Or do we accept and follow the observance of Sunday, as the Pope says we're supposed to do, and accept the authority of the papacy in the day that we worship? So behind the days is the issue of worship. Just like behind the tree in the Garden of Eden, the issue was, would Adam and Eve live by God's authority, or would they live by Satan's authority? So the issue is not only days, the days are only the way in which God tests us to see which authority we will accept. And there are people who are saying, Pastor Bohr, you're crazy, there's never going to be a Sunday law. Believe me, there will be. Listen to the next lectures that we're going to study. We're going to find that in the United States there was an attempt in the 1860s, 1870s, and 1880s to have a Sunday law. And there are rumblings today in the United States and in the world clamoring for a Sunday day of rest. So don't miss the next exciting study in this series on Matthew 24.